about a year ago, uh, there was this one comic that started flo floating around on the interwe interwebs. And it looked like this. Can you guys see this? There's two guys. And the first guy tells the other guy, so how do I query the database? Apparently, they've in installed a new database. And the second guy says, it's not a database. It's a key value store. And then the second guy says, OK, it's not a database, but how do I query it? You write the distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. And then this first guy says, did you just tell me to go fuck myself? <laughs> I believe I did, Bob, says the second guy. So I'm going to be talking to you today about databases, uh, in particular NoSQL. Uh, how many in this room have heard of NoSQL before? So what's that? 30%, something like that? OK, <laughs> including you, it's 70% <laughs> it's because you did. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I'm going to talk to you about NoSQL. Um, and it's an, it's an adaptation of a talk that I gave last, night, well, yes, last morning uh, in London at uh, a conference called NoSQL Exchange. Uh, so it's pretty geeky. It's pretty focused. Um, and uh, it's a lot about why da databases are changing a whole lot today. Basically, we've been using databases in the same way for 40 years. Um, and then all of a sudden, in 2009, we had this explosion called NoSQL of alternative databases. Um, and the question is why, right? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I really have only one ground rule for all my talks, uh, and that is I do not want your undivided attention. Um, you guys are all online, I assume. Tweet, give feedback. Uh, the only thing that I do ask is that you use the Neo4j hashtag. Um, this is my name. Let me know if I'm doing good or bad. And let's just, just you know, keep it interactive. I have 45 minutes-ish, an hour. So just like, let's just keep it interactive and chat. All right, so I'm going to talk to you about three things. I'm going to talk to you about the present of NoSQL and alternative databases. We're going to have a brief look at the past and then the future. Um, how many in here are either, uh, okay, how many in here are familiar reading code? One, two, three. Okay, good. There's not a single line of code. Well, there's some code, but uh, just to get a sense of how, how technical uh, you are. Good. Um, so, NoSQL. So, uh, first off, let's start with this, the name, NoSQL. Uh, everybody hates the name. It's a horrible name because people think that it means uh, no to SQL or never. SQL, but the truth of the matter is that no, no SQL is actually not only SQL, as in the observation that the backends of the future will consist not only of SQL databases, the MySQLs and the Oracles and the IBM DB2s of the world, but also key value stores and graph databases and these alternatives that are rising up right now. And really broadly speaking, it's not an anti-movement. It's not saying, you know, fuck off Larry. That's not the point, even though you know, I wouldn't mind owning his, his yacht at some point, right? Um, that's not the point. The point is that we've lived for 40 years now wh where we've taken all the data that we have and we shoved it into this one tool called the relational database, the SQL database. And that era, the era of the one-size-fits-all database is over. Um, the, the data sets that most people handle today are big enough and complex enough that we're not going to be able to take all of it and squeeze into one tool, not even a graph database. So I represent graph databases, but not even that. I, I love graph databases. But all data does not fit in one paradigm of data anymore. Um, and that's the bigger story of NoSQL. So the question then is, no, why now? Why did NoSQL explode uh, just now in 2009? And there are four, thre four trends that I'm going to tell you really quickly about. The first one is that of data set size. This is probably obvious to most people in this room. Uh, this is, there was uh, an analysis by IDC, the analysis firm, in, in 2006 or 2007. And they tried to estimate how much new, unique digital content was created in 2007. And they came up with this number, 40 exabytes. And an exabyte is 10 to the power of 18. So quite a lot of, um, of um, you know, bits and bytes. Um, and it's actually more than the, all the amount, total amount of available hard disk space for the first time in the point of the digital history. Um, but that's not the amazing thing. The amazing thing is, the, is this, the growth curve. They expected it to grow exponentially. And what's funny about exponential growth, as we all probably know, is that last year we had 988 exabytes of unique new digital content, a text message I wrote or a web page or something like this. Um, 
which is more in this year than all the previous years combined. And the same thing is true of this year, and next year, and the year after. So there's a shitload of new data being created, basically. So that's the first trend. The second trend is a little bit more subtle, I think. It's that of connectedness. Um, this is probably going to be too small for, uh, for everyone in the room. Um, but if we uh, have a, uh, a little chart here where the x-axis is time, decades, we have the 90s here and Web 1.0 in the 90s. We have the 2000s, Web 2.0 and 2010 with Web 3.0 here, right? Um, and then we have some sort of indication of connectivity of information on the y-axis. And if you look at technologies being developed, we have text documentations way back in the days, even obviously earlier than the 90s, and you know, stuff that we typed up in, in just normal word processors, which are completely isolated information structures. There's no connectivity between them whatsoever all the way down here. The mid-90s um, and the first generation of the web popularized hypertext, was obviously invented earlier than that. We got popularized over here, which has one level of connectivity on top of these text documents, right? You now have links that you can click on and you get to another document. We moved up one level. Web 2.0 popularized many of these technologies here. Um, I'm not going to go through each and every one specifically, and they're honestly fairly arbitrarily chosen. But if you look at something like blogs, um, how many here are familiar with the trackback functionality of blogs? Right. So basically, a trackback means that um, if I wrote a blog post about this from my blog saying, you know, I was at Black Box Connect yesterday, um, Fadi was very, very cute, right? Which, which that's usually the kind of blog post that I write. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and then my blogging software would send a trackback ping over to the black box blog. And then that, that trackback might be visualized as a link on the black box uh, blog. But really, the semantics of that connection is we're in a conversation. You can imagine ri writing a web spider that mines the web for people who are talking to other people, people who are in a conversation and not just who are linking to one another. So we've clearly added one level of connectivity to information here. Like I said, I'm not going to go through these technologies in detail. The interesting thing is this, the trend over time information is becoming more and more connected. So that's trend number two. Increasing uh, volume of data, increasing connectivity of data. If you look at, no, then we have e uh, increasing semi-structure. So semi-structured information is information that has many mandatory attributes, but few optional ones. Sorry, the other way around. Few mandatory attributes and many optional ones. So let's say that you write uh, like a salary list, right? So in the 70s, you might have a payroll system where you have first name and last name and age and title and salary. That's it. Every row in that salary list looks identical to all other rows in terms of their structure. Um, today, you know, it's very common that you have more than one title. You know, like s someone commented before, you know, who in the valley works on only one thing at the same time. A lot of people have many, uh, many titles, right? Um, and the way you would model that in table is that you basically have to add a title two and a title three and a title four. Because there's this one guy down there, right, who has 17 titles. So you had like 17 columns, which will end up punish all the other rows that don't have all these titles. That leads to so-called sparse tables and is, um, and is one of the problems uh, with, with squeezing semi-structured data into relational databases. Sparse table, yeah. And this whole trend is sort of accelerated now that all of a sudden we have content generation being decentralized. And it's all out on the interwebs where you can, you know, I can sit down and I can create any kind of content and there's very little chance that I'm going to adhere to the same kind of overall structure that someone else would do. Whereas previously we could sort of force top down and say that, hey, everyone needs to use this kind of a schema. And the fascinating thing is that if we lump both of the trend two and three together, connectedness and semi-structure, and call that data complexity, and we look at the performance characteristics of a relational database, of an SQL database, it looks like this. In face of increasing data complexity, we have lower and lower performance. And this is due to joins, because every hop in a relational data, I'm sorry, every hop in a graph-shaped structure is a join in a relational database, and joins are known to be incredibly expensive, um, and due to the sparse tables that we talked about before. Which is all fine if you're building salary lists, right? Very tabular, simple, well-structured data. 
And these are the kind of systems that we built back in the 70s where we, uh, when we as an industry invented the relational database. You know, most computer systems at that point were, you know, form translation stuff, right? I mean, that's what they did. They looked at a form like this, let's put that into the computer. That was sort of the, what, what we did with computers back then. Very tabular, very well structured. Today, even the majority of the web applications out there deal with substantially more complex data and thus has substantially less performance. And there are a bunch of verticals that are completely outside of this little thing inside here that I call the realm of SQL, the zone of SQL adequacy, where relational databases, where SQL databases work. And, you know, the famous example is Facebook, right? I mean, they, they have tens of thousands of machines today with more, more than one terabyte of data that they use uh, to do their in-graph operations, to figure out if I should see your update on my newsfeed, for example. The fourth trend is maybe subtle if you're not super geeky, uh, <laughs> which is a, a trend in architecture. Way back in the days, in the 80s, it's like hundreds of years ago, right? Um, a, typical a typical application architecture looked something like this, right? You had one application, it used the database. The database over there was typically delivered to you by Larry, right? And he, you know, for, you know, uh, for that favor, we gave him lots and lots of dollars. And he used those dollars to build a big yacht that I one day will own. Um, so that was the in the 80s, right? And then in the 90s, the funny thing that happened is that we started building more and more applications, except that we all used the same database. So all these applications were connected to the one database. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that all of a sudden, when you want to change something in one application, it may cascade and change things over here. I grew up as a professional programmer in the 90s. And the problem I always had was that when someone told me to write a nifty new feature, what I had to do is I had to walk up to the DBA, right? Database asshole, DBA. Um, and, and ask him, like, can I, can I add this new uh, table or can I alter the schema? Because I needed that for the new functionality that I was tasked to write. Um, and of course, he always said no, right? And, you know, which is why he was the database asshole, right? Um, and even if for once he said yes, the chief architect would always say no because he could not foresee what happened if I started changing things that made a complete perfect sense from the, for this application down here. It would cascade across to all these other applications in unforeseen ways, right? And, you know, five or ten years later, when I was the chief architect, I was the guy who said no, right? Because it was very, di very difficult to do that when everything was tied to the one database. In the 2000s, I'm going to be very careful here. We're very slowly moving towards a more services-based architecture. I don't want to use service-oriented architecture, but may, I mean more services-based architecture, right? Where a lot of people think that it makes a whole lot of sense to um, ba bake your architecture, base it on services. And every service speaks something domain-oriented on the wire. So your application lives up here and it's going to tell this application to add account. Not insert into accounts table or something like this, but add account. And whatever database this guy used as a persistence backend, is, that's up to, up to the database. I'm sorry, that's up to the service. So that makes it, of course, very possible for you to swap out your database into something that is a lot more specialized. Those were four trends, why NoSQL exploded just now in 2009 rather than in 2002 or 2014. So what is NoSQL, right? So um, we started talking, I started like diving into the why before really talking about the how and the, and the what, right? So one of the problems with NoSQL is that it's a hyped word. And that's one of the things that we love about the Valley here, right? That as soon as there's a hype, everyone is that hype, right? Um, and NoSQL is also not a scientifically de de defined term. So if you have this clicker, for example, here, is that NoSQL? Well, yeah, it kind of is, right? I mean, no one can say that it's not. It doesn't support SQL, right? So I guess, I guess it's NoSQL, right? And since it's a hype word, every project out there wants to be NoSQL now. So sometimes it seems like there's two new NoSQL projects every week. Um, but if you squint a little bit, you can see that there are four main categories of NoSQL. I'm going to quickly go through each and every one of them. The first category is that of the key value stores. Key value stores include uh, Project Voldemort from LinkedIn, React, uh, uh, NoSQL, um, uh, NoSQL 
company that actually announced new funding today. They raised $5 million uh, today, which is, which is great. Um, and these guys are all based on this one paper published by Amazon in, you know, in the mid-2000s when Amazon said, hey guys, you know, we've been running an Oracle for quite some time, but honestly, it's not enough to get to the kind of scale that we need. So we, we were forced to invent our own database, and we call it Dynamo, and here's how it works. And basically, the data model here is that of tall and skinny tables. So law, you know, basically, um, a very large table which contains of only keys and values. That's it. Nothing more. So the typical example here is uh, you have uh, a login system for a big website, right? You know, you, you know, I go to Amazon.com, I type in my username and my, my password. You know, my password will be hashed and sent over to Amazon, and then Amazon will take that hash and match it with what they have on disk. So they have a username, my username, and then they want to have um, the, the hash they have stored on disk. Key value, that's it. Super simple data. Uh, absolutely kick-ass to store in something like uh, a key value store. The big thing that has happened here in the past couple of months is this, right? Oracle entry. So it's funny, right? So Oracle in, in May of 2011, four or five months ago, released this one white paper where they talked about NoSQL, which was the first communication that they've ever had about NoSQL. And, you know, Gandhi said first they, first they what, what is it? First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then you win, right? And they'd clearly ignored us up until you know, May of 2011, May of this year. Um, and they, they wrote this, this white paper saying that, holy shit, you know, you should never use NoSQL. It's not safe. It doesn't scale. It won't store your data. It's communistic. They had everything in there, right? You know, you should not use NoSQL. And then three weeks ago at Oracle Open World, they announced their new NoSQL product. And funnily enough, that white paper can't be found anymore. <laughs> so they announced Oracle NoSQL. So that's the latest entry in the NoSQL space, which of course is huge, right? Because uh, the whole big question before has been, is NoSQL ready for the enterprise? Is this uh, just a web kids phenomena or is it something that the big, uh, you know, big Fortune 500 Global 2000 companies need? So, so just to check, <laughs> in a key value store, if you would put everything in there, you would have a lot of those separate key value stores, right? That's the whole idea. So for a user, you would get his name from there, his list from there, or if you No, would you would actually only have one. Next to it. And then you, no, you would not actually typically have only one, but then you would com uh, do different types of keys. Huh. So if you put something else in there, you would do a different type the of name is key. Different from there. Yeah. Right. Which, which is interesting that your question here points to one of the weaknesses with, uh, with these guys. Yeah. The, the power is that it's amazing scalability. You know, if, if you can adhere to this one schema, which is keys and values, that's it. You get amazing scalability. The problem is that the world is typically more complex than just a tall skinny table. You typically want to store more <laughs> in that, right? Um, and that's when the key value stores break down. I think it's very, very difficult to build an application backed only by key value stores, unless you're a very heroic programmer and want to spend a lot of time compensating for the database's shortcoming. Good question, though. Um, the second uh, ca big category is that of the big table family or column family uh, uh, guys. And the lineage here is that of big table, um, a research paper published by Google. So basically the same story as with Amazon, where Amazon said, you know, where Google said that, hey guys, we've also been able to push our systems to some uh, amount of scalability. Um, and the way we've done that is by basically ditching the relational database and we built this one database system that we call Bigtable. And the data model of Bigtable is um, creatively uh, that of a big table. <laughs> so basically, uh, it's a big table. But the funny thing about this versus SQL is that every individual row actually has its own schema. So remember how we talked about the semi-structured data before, where we could have like 11 titles and 17 titles for this one guy? Well, if that's the case, then we could just create you know, a unique schema for this one row, saying that this one row can actually have 17 titles, which won't end up punishing the other rows. Famous examples here, HBase, Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra was invented at, at Facebook, or so the mythology goes, at least. Um, HBase is uh, from the very popular Apache Hadoop project. The third category is that of document databases. How many in here have heard of MongoDB? So MongoDB is, I think, today the most popular of no, the NoSQL databases, um, and it's a document database. 
Um, and basically, the data model of a document database is that what they call documents. So they basically abstract everything into these documents that are key value pairs that you can, um, so like uh, I would be a document, name, Emil, age 33, 34, how old am I? 34, that's right. Um, yeah, <laughs> Google it, um, et cetera, right? So I add all the metadata about myself in this one document. So that's the data model over here. Um, and the lineage here is from Lotus Notes, uh, which is probably not the best mail program in the world. I'm not sure if anyone here has used Lotus Notes as a mail program. It's not an amazing experience, but it has a pretty fascinating backend database architecture. Um, and basically, what Mongo and CouchDB have, have done is that they've taken that and modernized it for the, for the web. And then the fourth category is that of graph databases, right? And graph databases, is, that's my corner of the world. You know, you have a vendor on stage now, so like I'm going to be, you know, I'm very biased to this. So after this presentation, you're going to feel that that was a pretty unbiased presentation. But I think graph databases are the best. <laughs> just, just to sort of set, set the expectation. Just let you know how to get it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and basically, the data model for the graph databases are like the document databases. Um, nodes, these nodes can contain key value pairs. So we have name, colon, Emil, right? Age, colon, 34. And then we have other nodes. So this is name, colon, Fadi. And then we have type relationships between these nodes that represent how am I related? How is this node related to this, this node? So this is a nose. Um, Fadi works at name colon black box, etc. Right? And so the observation here is that very, very seldom, I mean very frequently in, in modern systems is the value actually in how things are connected to one another, not just the actual data in and of itself but how are they related to the world? And that's the fundamental thing that separates graph databases from the rest of the pack. Other than that, if you remove the relationships, they're actually very incredibly identical to document databases. So could document database start to evolve into graph database? They could. Um, they could definitely do that by adding these things. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, that may very well end up happening. Um, and it's very simple to imitate a document database from a graph database. Just ignore the relationships. Exactly. Right. So, so this so is. Does that make it compatible with each other, or is that? Um, I think over time they're going to be competitive. Do you want another? Mm -hmm. I think. Actually. But but data could be read from both. both it things. could. So one of the things about these models is that they're also called isomorphic, which means you can always take data and put it in one of them. So that's not the interesting the okay. question. The interesting question is. Does your data, shape of your data, lend itself well to that data model? So for example, if you have data that is very connected, you can put it into a key value store, you can put it into a document database, but really you're only going to get the amazing performance benefits and productivity benefits if you have a map between the data model and the, and the shape of the data. Like a, a graph database, if you have connected data, it's like a thousand times faster, a million times faster than Oracle, my SQL. It depends what shapes. I mean, yeah, if you, have, if you have connected data. So we're talking about the context. So what are these contexts? What are the shapes? Of the, the oh, so, so yeah. So if you have connected data, graph database. If you have like for social networks, this is social database. networks, bioinformatics, um, master data management, network management, cloud management, geo data, everything where the connections is the value. Which is the majority of the massive amount of data we're getting yes. today. Wow, I want to invest in your company. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is the majority of the yeah. time. He has no money. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I, have a question. I mean, that's the whole point of relational database as well, right? The relation and stuff. So my data looks like this. Any data I know looks like this to me. Well, so what is much relational? Yeah, to so that? actually, the relation in relational database is actually relational algebra, which is a class of mathematics, which is actually set theory. So uh, a relational database is actually about taking uh, one subset over here, like if the query is give me all my friends that are, uh, not all my friends, that's better, give me all the people that have uh, a name starting with A and that are older than 18. Mm -hmm. Then what a relational database will do is that it will first select the big set of all the people with, uh, with um, a name starting with A, and then all the people that have an age starting with <coughs> 18, and then do a set merge of these two. Mm -hmm. And that's the relational algebra. 
It's actually not related to 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 related data. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's just that my data all feels like a relation. You know, I have, for instance, trainings on my site, and they belong to a provider. Yeah. And someone requests a brochure, and that belongs to a training. Yeah. And so, I would sort of automatically add any data to this format, and thereby this would be the only format needed. I agree. I thought. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, I, I think a lot of people in the the challenge, I think, for many of the NoSQL. Uh, folks is that a lot of people have been trained as computer scientists to deconstruct things like this because when we draw shit on whiteboards it's usually connected data structures but computer scientists have been trained to deconstruct that into tabular format yeah. using first normal form and ER modeling and third normal form and, and shit like that and take that and sort of squeeze it into tabular format uh, because that's been the only available tool so far now there's, it's not anymore so to, to, to shoot um, it will not fit when uh, I have more data than uh, interconnected or related data. Yeah, if it's if storing if a bunch of images. If the data is not, yeah, that's a very good example where, where it doesn't fit. Or if you have very tabular data, let's have, say we have that salary list, we talked like the early salary list in the 1970s, right? Very, very tabular data like this. Then it's going to fit very well into a relational model. Cool. Um, so these are the four uh, NoSQL categories. Um, interesting thing if we, if we look at these, and we sort of touched on this already, is that a lot of people think that NoSQL is all about scaling to size. Like how, how do you cope with you know, gazillion and gazillion of petabytes of data, right? Uh, but there's also how do you handle complexity? You know, how do you deal with data that is more and more connected and more and more semi-structured? Um, and here's, where, where if we map these four models here, you can see that they're all distributed differently. Um, on that, right? So graph databases are great at handling a lot of connected data, but it's more challenging to get to scale to massive sizes. Whereas key value stores are great at storing simple data, um, but not very challenging to get them to store data that is any amount of uh, flexibility. And, and the big table, I'm sorry, I just, I just uh, I missed that one for a second. The, the big table and the hyper table and the, what was the, the call of family stores? Was it, how it works? It, it's basically, uh, the data model is, is that of a big table where every row can its own, have its own schema. So it's from, from wow. the highest perspective, it looks like a relational database, except it's good at this semi-structured information. So you can say that, well, this one row actually has 17,000 you know, size, size one through size, size 17, right? Mm -hmm. Or something like that. Um, and that's not gonna punish all the other rows. So is it fair, I mean, from a very simple minded way to see that the key value, the, the skinny one is just yeah. like, a, an oversimplification to like what one what up one kind of abstraction dimension or something into into something like um, like taking the level of complexity and squeezing it one level down. Yeah, simplified. Yeah, and and the column one is taking the level of complexity is exponentially up. And then and one then, more step. And then document databases. And the document database is like okay, let's put all this mess together in one. And, and then he said, let's put all this mess together in one and give it a Including the relationship between them. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, where would the MySQL would be here on this uh, graphic? MySQL would be here. Outside. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So basically, if you, have, if you have data that is very complex, the joints in MySQL will kill you. Mm -hmm. If you have data that is very big, the lack of horizontal scalability will kill you. So MySQL is here. Mm -hmm. um, where's 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 sorry. The same area with Postgres? Um, so so at the, at, if you start talking about individual databases, uh, this level of abstraction breaks down. We're going to have to be more detailed and more, I think, factual. But like relation, the relational model is here. All of them are Oracle, ISA. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Doesn't matter. And should we do something with this? <laughs> should As we panic? Uh, so, to change our databases? To well, <laughs> that's a really big question. I think, honestly, no. if, if most people are our founders in here, it's yeah. very likely that the biggest problem you have is not the database. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem is that you haven't yet validated the paying customers. Mm -hmm. So well, until then, do whatever is simplest. Yeah. Whatever is simplest. Because, you know, you're not going to get to scale. That's the thing. Yeah. Most people don't get to scale, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a problem with it today, you probably should probably should start there. <laughs> the one thing though is that most of these databases are faster to develop with. It's faster to get that early prototype out the door. 
And that is really powerful. And then when you do run into scale problems, when you are, when you are successful, then you can start looking at which one is specifically and suits your application best. Then, is it doable now, working with them? Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah. But it turns out that many of them have been around for quite some time and are used by some of the biggest websites and, and Fortune 500 companies in the world. We'll get to that. So we actually talked a little bit about actually this is a good segue into the past. So I want to just take a really brief moment and look at what happened a while back. So SQL, right? Uh, the foundation of any you know, information bearing system the past 40 years. Um, got started, I just put a bunch of things in here. I'm not going to go through them in, in, in detail. And they're mainly Oracle focused, not because I think Oracle uh, single-handedly or singularly deserves credit for SQL, uh, but because they've been the most dominating vendor. Um, but it was actually, the theory of SQL was actually invented at IBM. Uh, but then Oracle saw it, and Larry borrowed some ideas from some papers that he saw. Um, and started building one of the biggest companies on the planet based on it. The fascinating thing is that if you look here in this time area in the late 70s and the early 80s, that most there were there were no real database companies at that point. Most um, databases lived inside of the big computer companies because this was back in the days when computer and hardware were, when were hardware and software were bundled into the same thing. There were no pure software companies. Um, but all of them had themselves invented, in, you know, inside of them had in invented relational databases. Then all of a sudden Oracle comes along, spins out and builds its own business around it and gets VC funding by mid 80s. And by the end of the 80s, there are only four competitors left. There were 50 around this time frame. There are only four left and the, the relational market grew from nothing to into a billion and a half dollars. One of the fastest growths of a, of a product category that, that we've seen. Oracle bought it all and killed the revenue. Something like that, yes. Um, if we then look at NoSQL and we map some years here, uh, 30 years uh, in later, uh, we see that we have a very similar sort of history. First off, I usually t say that graph theory was invented way back in the days, um, way before SQL history, uh, SQL theory, but that's a different story. But, but actually the way it evolved is that here, all the databases lived inside of the big computer companies. In here, all the big online services, all the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world invented their own database, invented their own NoSQL database. Um, but they didn't use them. I mean, they, they didn't publish them externally. And the same thing happened here, right? Then all of a sudden, Oracle came along up here, and all of a sudden, NoSQL exploded. And there are all these open source uh, versions of, the, of these databases being out in the open. Um, currently, there is. You know, we're in this, in this phase where there's 50 or 100 NoSQL databases. Maybe where we'll go is that it's going to converge and we're only going to have four dominating vendors and it may be a billion and a half dollars at, at the end of the... Uh, what is that? Probably definitely should invest. Well, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Um, there's an interesting parallel, right? How, how, the, how the relational market evolved in the early 80s and how the NoSQL market is evolving right now. If you look at some of the biggest companies on this planet, some of the biggest web properties, Amazon and Facebook and Twitter, they store roughly half of their data in SQL databases and half of it in NoSQL databases. It's kind of interesting, right? And what I think is that due to these trends in information, most enterprises out there, most companies out there will have an information complexity very, very similar to what Google had three or four years ago. So I think most companies out there will actually end up with both SQL and NoSQL. How's it going? So that was the brief excursion into the past. A um, couple of things about the future. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is uh, an adaptation, as I said, about from the NoSQL conference yesterday. So it may be a little bit more details than um, some of you want. Um, the first one is that it one of the sort of key things about NoSQL so far has been to re reduce transactionality. How many in here are familiar with transactions in databases, how they work? So basically transactions in databases means that if you're doing multiple operations, you want all of these operations to all succeed or none of them succeed. T 
typical example is that of two bank accounts, right? If you have a bank account A and a bank account B, and you subtract $50 and add $50 over here, you basically want to transfer money. You don't want your computer to crash, you know, after, the fir after we've subtracted the money, but before we've added it. And if it does, you know, the database should either leave it here or add it here. And that you, that's when you group those things into a transaction and say that all of these need to commit or none of them need to commit. And what NoSQL has done so far is that they basically reduced a lot of these kinds of tra transactionality. Um, but recently we've seen that being added a lot. So Mongo added durable logging recently. Cassandra's added that. And there's a bunch of geeky things that, that a lot of people say about in the NoSQL space talking about how actually it turns out that when, when you reduce transactions, um, most people's usability, uh, you know, the, the way they use the, the databases go down substantially. There's query languages. One of the things that NoSQL re removed is, is query languages, which ends up not probably being a good idea. Uh, Mongo, again, is, is, is a good example of uh, a database that kept query languages in there, which, of course, SQL is a big query language, right? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why Mongo has been one of the most uh, popular ones. Why exactly is that? What is cool about query languages? So it turns out that if you only have a programmatic interface to, to a database, that means that when you're writing an application, it becomes really simple to, to write to that programmatic query interface. And if you know your queries beforehand, which if you, knew write, if you write an application, you do. Because you write the application, you know the queries beforehand. That's the, the, the most simple way of doing it. The problem is that just in reality, many times you actually want to have an administrator log on and just hack out some queries. You want to run reporting. You want during development time to be able to just hack away some queries. And if you don't, and the programmatic API doesn't support that. Yeah. Framework. Yeah. What's that? Then there's a framework for that. And stuff like that. Yeah, so but when you add a query language, you, all of a sudden you have that interactive way of querying the data. Figuring out the data. So a bunch of things about uh, NoSQL challenges, but I thought I would not go in actually too much detail uh, uh, about that. Uh, a lot of that in there. So conclusion, right? So there's an explosion of alternative databases. Uh, there's, like we mentioned, there seems to be a new NoSQL database every week now. Um, if you looked at NoSQL about a year ago or two years ago, much of it was immature. Uh, it was very, you know, 0.3 and 0.4. My, my project started in 2000, and we released the 1.0 version of our product in 2010. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? But some of the biggest web properties in the world run on NoSQL databases. The same NoSQL databases that you guys can use them and, and download. You know, our product is used by Adobe, by Cisco, by some really big Fortune 500 companies. They're using it for really mission critical stuff. So if you looked at it a year ago um, and thought it was too immature, um, now is a good time to look at it again. Um, and. Uh, I think I have no idea how I'm doing time. It's 40 minutes. You said 45 minutes, so I think we can leave that for uh, for questions. Q&A. These no. transactions, you kill feature of your product. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is. <laughs> Correct. Which one should we use? Th that and the data model. Which one should we use? Is the data is complex and it's uh, growing the amount of uh, data. Which one should we use to be safe in choosing it now? So that's always going to be dependent on your specific use case, right? I mean, the only real way to do that is to, to select three, four candidates and write a quick prototype, invest a day or two with every one of these and see which one works best. Mm -hmm. I mean, my answer will likely be Neo4j is a really great database, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's that's my job. But as you grow, it will change again. This thing. Yeah, and it, but yeah, right. th that's true. I think you should probably have a sort of a Google approach to that, where they say, you know, whatever system you decide design today, design it for your current scale up to 10x of that. Hmm. Because you know, if you try to design it for 100x, it's not it's going to be it's useful. Right? But you're going to need to apply the lessons that you learn getting to 10x mm -hmm. in order to get to that. Yeah. So I think, I mean, this whole thing where I mean, we talk to a lot of startups, and all of them really think that they're going to be the next Google, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous because we all know that we're going to be the next Google, right? So <laughs> I don't know what the guys are talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so they build this 
and, you know, and then what he designed the system for infinite scalability, and I think that's usually not the biggest problem in most startups. No. Also, not really a good idea. Right. Other question? Yeah, so how it works with Django? Um, so, Django is actually very sophisticated support yeah. for, for uh, non relational databases. Um, we have a plugin for, for our database for Django. Uh, I don't know what, I know that Bongo has one. I'm not sure what the story is for the rest. Okay. Yeah. What about the qualification of programmers? How to find the proper programmers and um, so is it is it really the problem for a new company which will choose to use no no SQL? That's a good question. I had a slide on no SQL challenges that I skipped over really fast. The number one challenge there was mindshare. Like if you want to find a SQL programmer, throw a rock here in the valley and you're going to find 12,000 guys, right? Um, it's not, you know, with the same rock you're going to find four guys who know MongoDB, two guys who know Bigtable, and one guy who knows Neo4j, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that is a challenge. I do think that uh, that's only time will solve that challenge, right? Um, and, and it sort of depends on where you are, I think, on the risk averseness. <coughs> and I think if, you, if you're a startup, um, I mean, if you're a huge, big enterprise, then it's probably important to be able to import, you know, 10,000 Indians who all know how to write Java, EE, and SQL, right? Uh, I mean, you, you sound like you're probably from Russia, so say 5,000 Russians who can do that, right? Or whatever, right? Um, but uh, maybe for a startup, that's not, maybe that's not the most important, uh, but your mileage may vary. I agree, though, that it is a, this, that is a challenge for NoSQL before it hits mainstream. Where Amazon uh, use your server, use your database? Uh, they actually, so I, I, I can comment on Amazon specifically. Uh, we have a lot of people that are cloud providers that, that use our database uh, to basically figure out, um, <coughs> do root cause analysis when shit fails. So basically, um, sort of the problem that a lot of these folks have. Can can someone do the magic of Fadi? Can you do the magic? So you have a problem where you know, ten years ago or fuck it, three years ago you had this situation, right? You had you know, let's say that you, you took the average cloud provider out there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. The green. The green? Well, you see a lot of green. All right. Yeah, that would have been a smarter way. Uh, check out the big brain, some breath. Right. So, okay. Had a bunch of physical servers like this, right? Okay. I'm, I'm not recycling this in a good way. I'm going to start do, do garbage collection. All right, um, had a bunch of physical servers like this, right? And of course now all physical servers are virtualized into a bunch of virtual servers over here, right? Virtual servers. Um, this virtual server here runs, say, an application container like JBoss or something like this that runs an application. And over here is Fadi trying to, you know, buy a book or something like this, right? Um, then this application over here actually uses a database. Let's say that it is um, actually MySQL over here. And here we have a little switch, right? And this switch burns down. This switch burning down will bring down this physical machine, which will bring down this virtual machine, which will bring down this database, which will bring down this application, which will make Fadi not happy. Well, which will make Jeff Bezos not happy because he won't be able to accept Fadi's money. And that is a very complex connected data structure, right? And what the only thing that you see is this guy saying, I'm sad. And the problem could be anywhere in your big, very complex data set, right? Um, that's a very graph-shaped problem. And maybe something that someone like Amazon would be interested in looking at. Did that answer your question? So you solved the problem. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> so you solved the problem. Well, so, so if, if you put this data in a graph database, it's very, it's very trivial to see how, if this thing goes down, how does that cascade through the architecture? 
And if the only signal you get is that this guy is down, well, then something that touches this guy is probably down. And if you can reduce that to, you know, just really quickly say that, oh, these things are, uh, are its dependencies in a very fast way, it becomes a lot easier to, to find the root cause of this failure. The, it's, it's way faster to find the dependencies. I, a join here would probably, I mean, this is a, uh, well, it's an arbitrary path length up to level 10 join in a SQL database with a non-trivial amount of data that's hours, if not days and weeks. With something like Neo4j, uh, we, we traverse one million hops per second, which is like <laughs> substantially faster, right? So this is, you know, maybe 10 hops away, so that's, uh, one hundredth of a millisecond versus a week, right? That's that that is That's substantial improvement. Any other questions? Great. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thanks for paying attention.